first of all, I'd like to take a look at the European documentary landscape and to analyze what are the challenges and what are the opportunities of a common European documentary market. Although I know that a common European market is not exactly popular in Britain now, but let's make a distinction between documentary and uh, that thing. Secondly, I uh, will very briefly introduce you and show in what way the European Documentary Network can assist you in getting a slice of the European pie. Now, 20 minutes, it's a very rather, uh, it's a very limited time to deal with all these issues. And therefore, I look upon this uh, opportunity more as a starting point of a conversation to be continued later. In other words, I hope to hear from you after I've returned to the office for if there's one thing that I can already say about EDN, we are there for you and we listen to your concerns. A European market does exist and it's certainly worth your while joining it. And in the course of the past 40 years, the documentary genre has matured and it has become an essential part of the European culture. The right conditions have been created to allow for an international documentary filmmaking community to emerge and even to prosper. Documentary has become fashionable and today is increasingly appreciated by audiences of all ages. That's good news for you, I think. The last decade of the 20th century can rightfully be called the golden age of documentary. Alas, since the start of the 21st century, that gold has begun to turn into silver, then into bronze, and if, as a community, we don't act soon and strongly, we might end up with the scrap iron age of documentary. Now, let's not let that happen. For yes, our industry is facing multiple challenges and we need to deal with them. Just a couple of examples, not to discourage you. In a major territory like Germany, the co-production investments by broadcasters decreased by a factor between 30 to 70 percent and this tendency to make less money available can be witnessed all over Europe in most broadcasters. Strengths and slots for creative documentary diminish in number and reality TV, factual entertainment and scripted reality take over from creative documentary. And for a substantial part of the young audiences, your audience of tomorrow, these genres are synonymous to creative documentary, which of course they are not. The large majority of the commissioning editors and financiers that you meet in the pitching panels or in festivals or during markets, let me tell you, they are not the real decision makers anymore. They have to consult and get the approval from higher levels within the organization and the decision taking process before green lighting a project has in many cases become ridiculously long, ridiculously long. Often, it takes more than a year before one knows whether there will be a deal or not. And that is the start of the negotiations. So be patient with them. And to add insult to injury, increasingly investment decisions are taken only after having seen a rough cut. This puts all the financial risks on the shoulders of the producers, the directors and the teams. And in, <clears throat> and in no way, the lesser risk for the broadcaster is compensated by a higher investment sum. Quite the contrary, actually. In brief, today we are in a situation where the old business model, which has functioned so well for so many years, is disappearing and no new model is in place yet. At this moment, uncertainty on all levels is the result which makes life rather difficult, but not impossible. Now, don't get discouraged. The industry has, in, has been in crisis before, and we survived that situation uh, then. 
And I have no doubt that we will also overcome the current rather dark period, but as a community, we cannot sit still and hope that things will improve. Action is needed, and that action will have to be taken by you. But life goes on, in spite of everything, and in spite of the many challenges, there is a market out there, with some trends that can be clearly discerned. And I'm going to mention some of them. Maybe you can use them in the later discussions. Formatting, it's still the big word, whether we like it or not. <coughs> and some of the formatted slots are indestructible. Natural history, wildlife, archaeology, they are still popular, but be aware that the demands in terms of technical quality and production value are heavy. Producing in 4K will be the new big thing. The digital distribution technology has created the perfect environment for niche broadcasters. And popular music, sports, and all kinds of adventure and big impact documentaries are in demand, in huge demand even. But the acquisition amounts that are being offered by these niche broadcasters are very low and pre-buys and co-productions are rare. In the regular broadcasting schedules, creative docs are pushed aside by specialist factual docs. Once again, natural history, wildlife, archaeology, science, and all kinds of investigative documentary and even religion still find a market. But the broadcasters increasingly prefer um, primetime specials and limited series. That's another buzzword today, series. Creative docs with character-driven content or docs that are dealing with social and political issues are harder to fit on TV. Although, very recently we notice a renewed attention for them. Certainly in the Benelux and in Scandinavia, we see a large number of slots, no, we see a number of slots, that are interested in this kind of documentary. But in most cases, they will only acquire your doc once it's finished, which doesn't really help you to finance your film. And financing is still the beginning of everything. In general, I can say that there are surely less pre-buys around than before, and co-productions with some serious money are becoming a rare commodity. The creative documentary is pushed towards theatrical release and the festival circuit to reach an audience. And they do find that audience, I can assure you. But the problem is that no upfront money can be found in these uh, sectors. And also the back, at the back end, there is no real income from these screens. A positive note, one documentary style that is becoming popular and has a rather huge potential, it is a short documentary, especially for kids. Certainly something to keep an eye on. Also because film funds, European film funds, national funds, are beginning to create special provisions to support this new form of documentary. With the broadcaster investment decreasing, documentary filmmakers need to find alternative modes of financing. Life is not becoming simpler. Something that crowdfunding will bring a solution for the disrupted financing uh, model, but I disagree on that issue. I will not elaborate on that here, but I will be happy to discuss that with you later today or wherever we meet somewhere in Europe. Another much discussed matter is the question whether the cross-media approach or the 360 degree producing, so producing the same content but in a different form and for different platforms might be a, a way out of the financial maze. Although I am convinced that in the future a finance, financial model will develop that will allow the financing of this kind of programs, we are not there yet. I'm still waiting to hear about the first real success story that goes beyond the rare chance hit 
within a very limited, dedicated community. But 360 degree producing will become a part of the documentary value chain. That I'm absolutely certain of. And maybe it's because I'm an old man, but I'm a cool lover of interactive documentary. Recently, I had a meeting with professionals who are trying to find their way in that new environment. And even they admitted that the financing sources are more than rare and worse, actually, that the development process of this new sector seems to be more about design and coding than about content and storytelling. And because I have absolutely no talent for designing, because I'm too old to learn to code, and I do love a good story, I'm out of that game. But maybe you won't. The future will tell. What I do believe in, and that new trend is clearly visible on the continent, it's the increasing uh, importance of bilateral <coughs> or multilateral co-productions, producer to producer relationships. They become the key to a potential success because they open the door to national and regional film funds outside the UK and also allow documentaries to find a more international audience. And isn't that what we make documentaries for? So that people can watch them. Of course, these international co-productions are a potential source of misunderstandings, conflicts, disputes, and therefore the legal aspect of producing is becoming a real issue. The days are over that a production or a co-production agreement was drafted on a napkin. It has all become serious business now, and you'd better be prepared for that. The amateur days are over. I already mentioned that the digital technology is a real game changer in, oops, I think I'm already out of sync. Don't watch it. I already mentioned that the digital technology is a real game changer in our industry. Because for the first time in 60 years, and this is the right place to witness that, we are no longer in a technological evolution, but we are in the middle of a revolution that turns upside down all levels of the media value chain, including the documentary value chain. Nothing is what it is or what it was before. Easy to handle recording and editing equipment is available to everybody. And internet technology offers the possibility to distribute all kinds of content to a potentially unlimited audience. And this has led to the emergence of a very creative, but often not professionally trained do-it-yourself generation of filmmakers who first provided content to the numerous and very popular user-created content sites, but who increasingly are invited by the traditional media to work for them for very low uh, salaries. Although I see value in that on the societal level, there is also a danger in it for our community. Their work is driving the audience's taste and expectation towards a demand for free available content. And it seems that professional standards are a thing of the past. And then the conclusion could be, who needs us professionals? But isn't there any positive aspect to be found in the technological developments? Will the new players like Netflix, Hulu, Google TV, Apple TV, will they not create a, um, a need for more and more creative documentaries to be shown to a hungry and paying audience? Once again, the future will tell. But personally, I'm rather skeptical about the outcome of that. By now, I must have discouraged you a lot. I do have that effect on people, I know. <laughs> you, come, you came here to listen to some uplifting messages, some good news from across the water, and all I do is offer you a gloomy picture of the current situation and a not really optimistic view on the future. Is there really no good news to tell? Has even EDN lost confidence in the power of the European creative documentary? Of course not. Let me assure you that more than ever, we love the genre and we are convinced 
that good documentaries will always be around and will find the necessary means to be produced. But we are also sufficiently realistic to know that there is no such thing as a free lunch. If you want something, you need to fight for it. And that is why EDN exists. But EDN cannot do that on its own. We can only act in your interest if you inform us about your needs, about what's happening with you. And I think that this is the perfect bridge to offer some information about EDN, the organization that today I have the honor to represent here today. And I have to make this very short, there we go. Oops. How much time is left, please? Can somebody tell me that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. No, <laughs> no please tell me when I'm uh, close to the end. Uh, the European Documentary Network, it has been established in 1996, which means that this year we will celebrate our 20th <coughs> anniversary. Uh, I think that says something. It was not a kind of an association that was created just to be there. In 20 years' time, I believe that we managed to bring an international community uh, together. And as you can see, we are now close to 1,000 members um, coming from 61 countries at this moment. So actually, we, would sh we would should call it the, Euro the Worldwide Documentary Network. But since we get a lot of support from Creative Europe, of course, we call ourselves <coughs> the European uh, Documentary Network. The main office is in Copenhagen, although I am Flemish, I work out of uh, Belgium. So both places are quite cl close and near. What do we do? Well, uh, oops, uh, what do we do? Matchmaking, it's very important for us. We organize and we represent. I will go into detail about that. We do project and business consultation. So if you're new on the market and you don't know where to go and who to talk to, talk to us. We can help you. We publish. I will go into detail. We provide news and industry support. We follow up what's happening. We inform our members about it and we debate around it. We think it's also very important that documentary um, shows itself. We have always been very bad in self-promotion. And that's why we, we've created some uh, um, awards that are given to uh, some outstanding achievements. We put, with the help of Creative Europe, a lot of time and effort in developing new documentary talent. The documentary world, it's not only dinosaurs like myself. There's a lot of young people there who need help, and it's a great, a great pleasure to help them develop. And I think that has been said before, we encourage cross-border collaboration. Not because it's so nice, but because we need it. There is not one single territory in Europe where you will find the money for your documentary uh, with one source or in one territory. Co-production is becoming a necessity. But on the other hand, it does create a family and you are going to find very good friends there. But also some enemies. Let's be realistic. <laughs> and more and more what we are starting to do is defending the interest of the documentary sector. And that is absolutely necessary. With matchmaking, we bring together filmmakers, producers, sales agents, distributors, broadcasters, film funds, financiers together. We do that through online activities, we do it through offline activities, and we do it all over Europe. For too long a time, we have been uh, separated. We didn't talk to each other. We didn't work together. And if we really want to documentary to strive and to be successful, all these elements, all these people who are on a, work on a different level of the value chain, they need to exchange information. My success is your success. Your success is my success. That is our motto. So we exchange information and good practices. I've been a producer for 25 years. My God, the number of mistakes that I've made and the, the money I lost, it's horrendous. I will gladly tell you about it so that you don't make the same mistakes. And that's what we invite our members to do. And it functions. And of course, we open doors for our members. I remember 
going to the first MIP TV, a uh, big television market in Cannes, it took me three years before I understood how it functioned. And then it turned out that for three years I'd been talking to the wrong people. <laughs> and I didn't get in to the places that really counted. Believe me, we can help you getting, in getting there. As an organization, we do a lot of stuff. We organize workshops and pitching sessions. We do it either ourselves, like in Thessaloniki or in Lisbon Docks, and uh, one of our co-organizers is here. Um, and we also do increasingly online pitches, which means you don't have to travel, you don't have to pay for a hotel, you don't have to pay uh, for uh, meals. You sit at home and you can pitch to what we consider the best commissioning editors or financiers. Um, We've started organizing seminars, and I have to admit that there is an increasing emphasis on the business side of production. Because, as I said, it's becoming a very professional business. Of course, we have a keen eye on development and on new trends. We put a lot of effort in working with film schools, so that the gap between the theory and the practice becomes less deep. So many people are frightened when they come out of film school and they see what real life really is, and some talents even leave the profession, which we don't like at all. We started working on Docs for Kids because, believe me, it is a new form that is coming up. Even if I myself am not a big believer, cross media and interactive documentary are on our agenda because the younger persons in the team, they do believe in it. Um, and we also pay a lot of attention now to the outreach and the distribution of documentaries. The days are over that they could only be shown uh, on television or in cinema. There are so many other ways doing it, and it's better to know about them from the very beginning. Because if you want to be successful in applying to a film fund, this outreach and distribution plan is becoming a very important element on which you will be judged. And then there's a lot of market events. The ITFA Forum, of course, the Vatican of Documentary. Um, we work together with Meet the Docs at the Berlinale. We have a doc corner uh, at the Festival of uh, Cannes. And we have a very strong presence at the sunny side of the dock. Those of you who have already been to those places know how it feels, how lonely you can be with, in a group of 900 people who all seem to know each other, who all seem to sign contracts except you. You're the only one who's not doing a real job there. I know that feeling, and I, want, I don't want other people to have that feeling. That's why we are there to assist our members and make sure that the money that they invest in going to these places is well used. We also give project and business consultation. This can be personal contacts, like I hope I will have some with you. You come to me, you have a question, I do my utterly best to reply. I do that, my colleagues do that, and if we don't have the answers, we ask some of our members to get in touch with you. We've created a weekly EDN on demand, which means that our members can book a meeting with us, whether it's about a project, whether it's about, I don't know what, everything that has to do with documentary, they book a meeting, and on Friday morning, we make ourselves available for a one-to-one -one talk. And then, of course, as I said, we are there during markets and events so that we can give support to our people. Somebody offered me 500 euro for my 90 minutes documentary. Is this the right price that they pay? Who is it? Baltic States? Yeah, that is the right price. Is it Arte? They're screwing you. That's the kind of information <laughs> that uh, we can give you. So whenever you see us, and if you're a member, use us. We are not there to enjoy the sun of La Rochelle or the rain of Sheffield. We are there to help you. Two very important publications. The EDN Financing Guide, I dare to say that for most of my colleagues, elder ones and younger ones, it's the Bible. Because that's a booklet that is updated every year, and in it you will find all the public broadcasters and some more information, um, sources that are still interested in documentary. What kind of slots? Who's in charge? What kind of program are they looking for? What is the duration they're looking for? What is their email? What is their telephone uh, address? It's all in there. Members get it for free. Uh, you can also buy it, but believe me, it's much more uh, better to become a member because you get so much more advantages. Because, sorry, all these markets that I was mentioning uh, a couple of seconds earlier, we also uh, negotiate reduced fees with them or reduced uh, 
entrance fees with them. And for uh, some of these are even <coughs> so big that you recoup your membership in one uh, go. So financing guide, really the guide that everybody uses to know what's going on on the European broadcasting market, who's there, what are they looking for. But as I said, producer-to-producer -producer relations are becoming much more important. You have a subject that could be interesting for Bulgaria. How are you going to find out what the sources in Bulgaria are? What are the national film funds? Can you go there uh, yourself or do you need a co-producer? All that information we brought together in an online database that as a member you can consult. We only started doing this a year and a half ago, so it's in full development, it's not perfect yet, uh, but it is a very good tool and I'm sure it will become a second Bible quite soon. What do we publish and how do we stay in touch with our uh, members? Well, first of all, every week we send out an EDN weekly, which is not only sent to the members, it's also sent to people who are interested. The bad thing is that every week there is a little uh, block from me, which means that you will be subjected to my very bad sense of humor, um, but at least it opens the door for a more personal uh, conversation. The EDN weekly, uh, it gives you information about what's going on. It talks about upcoming deadlines, it talks about um, <coughs> events that happened, whatever. And there is a link with our website. You can go to our website, edn.dk, it will become edn.network in a couple of weeks, and find out a lot. And that website is open for everybody. You don't need to be a member to get access to the first layer of our website. And you will see that there is a lot of information available. If something happens in documentary land, believe it, it will be on the, la on the landing page. If you are a member, then you can go to a second level and get more detailed information. The EDN monthly, that is something that we send to industry contacts and to our members also, but mostly to industry contacts to keep them informed what is happening in documentary and why our sector is so important. And then, now and then, we will also publish a blog if we went to a festival or if there has been some kind of a, a special event. But just, I'm mentioning this just to let you know, once you become a member, we don't forget you. We will knock on your door continuously. And every time I will hit on the same nail, please contact us. Tell us what is happening. Tell us the good things, tell us the bad things, so that we can take action. Well, some of the uh, awards that we're giving, we give the EDN award uh, in this year in Thessaloniki. We actually gave it to Arte, to uh, Anne-Marie uh, Legrand, who is in charge of 360 degree development uh, and production and interactive documentary. So it's not because I, as the director, don't like it that we don't work with it. And I think that it was a very well-deserved prize. We also give uh, an award at the, uh, the Sarajevo Film Festival. And that is to young emergent talents from a region that is less rich than our region. And uh, we do the same in uh, DocLab Poland. Um, and that we do because we absolutely do not agree with everything that is happening politically and culturally in Poland. They really want to go back to the 1800s. And um, we want to give a single signal by really supporting um, uh, the young documentary filmmakers to the politicians over there that they maybe sh uh, should rethink what they are doing. We do a lot of tutoring. As I told you, we have our own workshops that we uh, organize, four days of work followed by a pitching session. Um, but we also partner with a lot of organizations. Actually, we do something like 50 or 60 tutoring events every year. And that is all over Europe. That's going from Norway to Portugal and from Ireland to uh, Greece and everything in between. Very, very intense <coughs> sessions where we don't uh, sell any bullshit. We tell you what the truth is. You might come out a little bit shaken, but you will come out with some very good information. Tutoring is done by our own team members, but also since we have these nearly 1,000 members, we can pick out other people, sales agents, producers, directors, writers, people who can contribute to the development of your project. And of course, the whole thing, and that's why it's called the European Documentary Network, networking, it's so important. A couple of years ago, a couple of people said that EDN stood for the Eating and Drinking Network because 
we always had, uh, or we, and we still do, whenever we go to a place like Sheffield, like Cannes, like uh, Thessaloniki, we have the EDN dinner. That's one evening when those who want, the members, are invited to a restaurant. They pay for their own food and their own drink, for those of you who are interested. Um, but it's a fantastic evening. It's so good to be able to talk to each other and to share your worries and to tell about your success. So networking, that is absolutely at the core of everything that we are doing. As I said, we are working on a worldwide level. We are not limited to uh, Europe. We encourage cross-border uh, collaboration. And for that, we work together with other organizations. We do it with the people from uh, Documentary Resource Initiative in India. We do it with DocLab in Poland. Uh, we do it with uh, Documentary Campus for Crossing Borders. And there we are really, really aiming for the Asian market. We do it with Ex Oriente in Czech Republic. Uh, 12 for the future and below zero, that's a Scandinavian collaboration. And in all, we have more than 70 events a year. Not only uh, tutoring events, also keynote events like this. But believe me, we travel a lot. Not because we like it. You've seen what happened in Brussels. You can imagine what it means uh, leaving Brussels at this moment with the, from the airport. But because we think it matters. It matters that you see us. It matters that you know our face so that you know who to come to if you need help. I think that's very important. And more and more, we are now developing lobbying activities. For a very long time, EDN has been concentrating on helping you developing your projects, pitching your projects. We still do. It's still important. But in these difficult, troubled times, you need a voice to stand up to the political powers and to the cultural powers that be and say, hey, we are here. You're not pushing us aside. And that's what we are uh, doing more and more. And for that reason, we try to make EDN into an umbrella organization. We already work together with many, many national organizations. But if you're working from Portugal or, for, or from Sofia or from Reykjavik, it's not easy to go to the uh, people who are in power in Brussels. We can do it. If you talk to us and we set up a strategy, and then we can go and defend your interests. And to really find out what's happening and what is the state of documentary now, we are going to organize in 2017 in Brussels an international colloquium, but based on facts and figures. We are working together with the universities of Bournemouth, of Glasgow, of Copenhagen, of Brussels, to get the right facts and figures. What does it mean, the documentary community? What are the problems that we are confronted with? And what shall we do? And we want to have a two or three day conference. At the moment, it's all uh, in, in the setting up, so I can't give you too many details. But please keep your eye open on it. That, I believe, is going to be a very important moment in time. And I think 20 minutes, and I'm sure I went over. Apologies for that. But uh, thank you for your attention. I will be here until 3 o'clock. Please come and talk to me.